morning. Welcome to the 18th annual IGF meeting of the Internet Governance Forum. Konnichiwa, hello, and as I say in my home countries, South Africa and Zambia, Dumelang and Molibuanju. In this dynamic panel, we connect global communities through 160 plus national, regional, and sub-regional and youth IGF initiatives. Focused on data governance and trust building, we will explore the vital link between reliable internet and effective data governance. Our discussions will delve into the diverse role of data and societal progress and sustainability. We'll assess the effectiveness of existing data governance mechanisms and examine the potential benefits of regional frameworks for robust data protection. The panel will analyze the differing impacts of data regulations in the Global South versus the Global North and explore the feasibility of a global par policy paradigm versus local solutions. Additionally, we will unveil practical strategies for enforcing data strategy regulations, especially concerning um, uh, 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 empowerment strategies for internet use users and data subjects. We will look at the culture of sound data and data governance, existing methodologies that can be used to refine data protection policies, examine the capacity of data governance frameworks, garner to, to enhance transparency and accountability in the data ecosystem. We'll break down what respons responsible data usage looks like in our society and like in values. Last but not least, we'll also look at uh, discussing the mitigation of internet fragmentation and the challenges associated with that. My name is Zanyu Ntatisi Asare. I'm an entrepreneur, advocate of the High Court of South Africa, with a focus on data protection and emerging technologies, CEO of DigiLegal, a consultancy providing regulation, policy, and information technology-based uh, services to both private and public sector clients. I've been afforded the privilege to be your on-site moderator for this main NRI session, titled Data Governance and Trust for the Internet We Want hosted right here in Kyoto, Japan. Joining me on, online as a moderator is Judith Hallestein from the United States of America. And I have this amazing panel in front of me. Um, so what I will do is to get this show on the road is I will allow my very capable panel to introduce themselves. The first question that we'll start with when I ask you to introduce yourself is to just explain from a regional perspective, an NRI perspective, what uh, specific mechanisms exist from your region or your, your locality, and do you believe that they're working? So if you could have name, where you're from, and do these mechanisms exist, and do you believe that they're effective? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Zanmi. My name is Charles Chaban. I'm the Middle East consultant for the International Trademark Association, known uh, for many as INTA. I'm here representing the Arab IGF. Um, and um, to answer your question, uh, there are many, of course, uh, laws in the region to, to, to tackle the data governance in general and sometimes data privacy. Uh, maybe it became a more important issue after the GDPR became known for everyone. So many of the countries in the region started having their own laws. Uh, but uh, to be even uh, very practical, some of them is mainly laws on the maybe not used a lot. So we need to tackle this even in the Arab IGF. So I think the best way to start my presentation is to mention something uh, that in the Arab IGF, we are supposed to have one in February next year, hopefully. So one of the main tracks is regarding data governance again. So I will just read a small uh, paragraph. It's, it mentions what are the description about this uh, track in specific. And I'm happy to know that our co-chairs of the uh, steering task force of the Arab IGF are here who have helped in that. So the data, the importance of data is on the rise. An organization wealth and value is measured today by the data it collects and owns on its users, clients, and individuals. In fact, data today became a vertical economy by itself. This data is used for engagement, growth, and monetization purposes. 
while it's acceptable for organizations to benefit from the data they collect on the individuals, it is far more important to protect and preserve the individual's right regarding the data collected about him or her. This is crucial since the collected data is not only related to the individual's biodata, but goes beyond that to include habits, behavior, and demographics. This is done today by almost all organizations interacted with through cyberspace and the internet. Therefore, individuals have an equal right to know what data is collected about them, how it is used, manipulated, and analyzed. They have the right to view it, review it, dispute it, and provide their consent to it. To address this challenge, data privacy and data governance became the focal areas to ensure the fair use and balance between rights of organizations and rights of individuals on how their data is used. So as you noticed, even in the Arab IGF, we want to even to tackle this more. So uh, hopefully we will have even more rigid laws to answer your questions uh, soon and uh, after the participation of all stakeholders in the region. Thank you. I go ahead, sir. Um, good morning, I'm Alison Gilwald from Research ICT Africa. It's a digital policy and regulatory and governance think tank, um, which is based in Cape Town but operates across the continent. Um, I'm also from the University of Cape Town Nelson Mandela School, where we have a doctoral program on digital economy and society. Um, I represent the African IGF proudly, and um, I have, I've been asked today to speak particularly about the African Union data policy framework, um, which Ria was technical advisors on. Um, but perhaps just to say, while we speak about trust, is that although there's been a lot of development around you know, the mechanisms you need in place um, for trust, these are often um, on the basis of assumptions around um, mature markets, mature democracies, um, rule of law, um, you know, high levels of human development, so a lot of absorptive capacity and ability to exercise one's rights. And these conditions don't necessarily pertain in other parts of the world that we need to create these trusted environments in. So the African Data Union, um, the African Union Data Policy Framework very much acknowledges this environment. It's a very high level principle document um, that uh, has these very aspirational and important um, rights-based um, principles um, in the document, but it also is committed uh, to, so that we can get on and do this to a progressive realization of these that we're actually all in very uneven you know, um, spaces and development. I should point out that the data policy framework is much more than a data protection framework. Um, the uh, effects of GDPR on the continent, of course, was that there was extensive rollout, not always effectively, of data protection um, uh, mechanisms on the continent. But this document, uh, this framework is, is far greater than that. It's about personal and non-personal data, and importantly about creating a trusted environment to unleash the use of non-personal data, and um, particularly within, within a number of initiatives which um, I can speak about on the continent. So the data governance um, framework is comprehensively covered in terms of you know, data access, control, quality, um, open data, those kinds of um, governance mechanisms that we need um, to create an effective uh, data economy on the continent. But it's also prefaced by a very important um, uh, front end first part of this document, which acknowledges the um, digital readiness and um, legal and um, human rights readiness frameworks that we need on the continent. So the first point to make probably is that, you know, only a third of Africans are actually connected to the internet. So while we're trying to create a trusted environment, it's highly exclusionary currently. So all of these um, foundational um, infrastructures, foundational um, law and uh, enabling law is required. And the document is um, progressive, I believe, <laughs> globally progressive in this, in this context in which it acknowledges the importance of um, inclusion, of equity, and of redress, importantly, um, in this environment and the need to create an enabling environment, which covers the kind of checkbox now on data protection and data security, but very importantly speaks about the importance of legitimacy. You don't simply get, those are necessary conditions for trust, but you don't get trust simply from data protection and a secure, in 
internet, you need to have the legitimacy around the enabling framework so that people actually feel it's a trusted environment. Thank you. Thank you for that, Alison. If we can move on to Raul, same question. If you can just tell us your locality, where you come from, and um, effectively, what are the mechanisms and are they effective? Yeah, my name is Raul Echeverria. Uh, I'm the executive director of Latin American Internet Association. That is a private sector association in the region, but I'm here uh, representing all the, 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 the LAC IGF community. And Latin America is a, is a region that is, um, is advanced on the, and the, um, fr providing frameworks, uh, legal frameworks for data protection. Uh, the, we, it's important to consider that the, we have as a reference, the, the, we have a reference that is a very solid one, that is the, the Inter-American System for Human Rights and the Inter-American Standards for Human Rights. Um, so the, the, all the, 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 the data protection legal frameworks are inspired or aligned with the, with the protection of, of the rights according to those standards. And the, there are solid institutions uh, in uh, or most of the countries have their own uh, laws on data protection. And most of the data protection authorities are independent. And the, 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 while we don't have a, a regional framework, we have a good level of coordination among the, the, the authorities and they work together. Uh, the, uh, the data protection laws uh, have been highly inspired in, in GDPR in the last uh, few years, but even the, the last ones, like the Brazilian example, I think is, a, in my view, is an improvement uh, with regard to, to the GD, GDPR. And, um, uh, we are seeing now a, a generation of uh, uh, discussions in most of countries uh, updating their, their local frameworks because uh, uh, even the, the, the countries that uh, were pioneers on, the, uh, on this field and their laws are, uh, are becoming old and they need some uh, updates and the, uh, uh, there is a lot of discussion in, in, in several countries uh, in, with regard to that. But the, I think this, this is a, a, a crucial. Uh, the, we, uh, you, sometimes we say, or we, he, we hear that uh, we live in a, um, in a uh, data-based economy, but uh, it's not totally true. I think that we should say that we live in a data-based uh, society. It's not only the, the economy. That uh, data is important for everything, for all the services we receive from public sector or education for many, many areas. And, so that it's important to, to have uh, uh, solid legal frameworks uh, in order to, to do the, 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 the management, to have a, a management of the data that make uh, available a lot of opportunities, but in a, in a trusted uh, way. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Chung, if you could give us a go at, at that question. Where do you come from? Uh, what's happening in your locality, and uh, we'd like to know whether you believe that it's effective or not. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, konnichiwa. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Um, I will pick in French, uh, since I'm representing the, the French IGF uh, here in, uh, in Kyoto. Bonjour à tous. Good morning to one and all. I will maybe begin by introducing myself, Lucien Castex. I'm the representative of public affairs and partnerships at the FNIC. And I'm also co-chair of GE France, which is one of the national entities here. Perhaps to introduce what I want to say, I would like to quote the philosopher Litwig Wittgenstein, who said that philosophy is a struggle against sorcery involving our intelligence by the means of our language. Today, with the internet and the debates that we have on data governance, we see that to understand internet or the internet that we want to have is first and foremost how to determine the terms in which this exists, data of course, the governance of the data, but the notion even of trust, what does that actually mean when we have trust in something? So these are considerable objectives that we have to attain. Now, if we can talk about this as something that we use every day, sometimes we use it without even knowing it. But we haven't yet building it 
not only from a technical point of view, but also from a societal point of view, with new uses forever coming to the fore. We need to search and find this equilibrium between the cyberspace security, but also the protection of our fundamental liberties and rights. This is often an arduous task, but it nonetheless remains essential. That is at the crossroads of what we all want to do. This is not only the 2030 agenda, but also the review in 20 years of the World Summit on the Information Society, but also the negotiations that are ongoing on the digital compact. In two words then, in France, but also within the European Union, there are various types of legislation that come to the fore and they're currently being negotiated or are almost going to enter into force. The RDDP, in terms of data protection, which has been up and running for a few years, has already had an impact. Today, when one looks at emerging technological regulation, in particular as concerns artificial intelligence, if we look at new digital services and what happens on this market, and also data governance acts, we are already setting the foundation with this legislation that would allow us to have the participation not only of citizens but also of states in data governance. Here we see myriad strategies, but one of the most important parts of this is that everyone plays a role, including citizens. And indeed, there are strategies that we see that want to involve this, not only in primary but secondary education, but all along our lives. And this constitutes a key for all of us to decode what lies ahead of us, because to understand is to take action. And in order to do this, we have to be able to understand what is at stake and understand what this data is. And this, of course, is important for this to be done transparently. We've had legislation in France against the manipulation of data in 2018. And we are currently thinking about the way, the way we use data. How do we protect children online? And how do we counter racial hatred? So all of this means that the role of data is essential in this. And the fact that this data can circulate is also of the utmost importance. So this, of course, is important for us, whether we have national or regional GDPR, we have all of these international fora and national fora all play an important role. We need to continue to have an overall vision that enables all of our cultures and diversity to be represented. Thank you so much. Contribution Chuang, if I could ask you to provide us uh, from, from your perspective, um, you know, where do we stand from your region or your NRI's uh, mechanisms from a data governments and trust perspective, and do you believe that these are effective? Yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is a very good opportunity for me to share our information uh, to you. Uh, I think this, uh, I will uh, focus on the data uh, security, accuracy, and timely. I think for the, uh, I'm from uh, China. Uh, uh, my name is Liu Chuang uh, from Chinese Academy of Sciences and the IGF. You know, uh, China is a big country, so, so many uh, uh, peoples and the people in the research and also uh, in the society want to get the data to, uh, to, uh, to support sustainable development. How make the data available to uh, uh, innovative discovery and also benefit the society. And I think that the first thing is data quality. How to make the uh, high quality data available? And uh, this is, uh, is a complicated uh, issues. Uh, scientists, they, they did a lot of work, research work, but they think this is the private, uh, this is uh, 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 intellectual property product, and how to balancing uh, property product protection and the open shared. So we discussed this for almost uh, 20 years in China. 
Finally, China made the decision at the open scientific data policy. So this is a national data policy. And then we established an infrastructure. We established data centers and, the, and the collect the data. We have the Global Change Research Data Publishing and the Repository. It was established nine years ago. And we have a serious uh, principles, guidelines, and policies, standards, uh, and the management, management procedures. Then uh, uh, up to now, then more than 1,000 uh, data sites have been published. And uh, more than 10 million access the data in the whole world in more than one country, uh, 100 countries. So this, this uh, data center was uh, uh, approved by the uh, World Data System to be World Data Center. And it got uh, uh, the research prize in the, 18, in the 2018 as an e-science champion. So this, uh, this product means we need to pre-review. The data site are put there and so many data, they are confused which one is high quality, which one can be used to transfer to another users. So this is the key of the data governance. And another, another big challenge is more and more data, terabytes, bytes, so many. How many data available to not only for research scientists, but for the society, for the local people, for the village people? So we start a new program we call the GIES. That means Geographical Indications, Environment, and Sustainability. We use this up to now, 101 partners join this program. And we open data, open knowledge, and open case samples. And then together with the big data, and the Internet of Things technology. And also in the case engineering uh, examples, together with the systematic management and the geography culture get together. So the cases, 17 cases in China, they are not two years, very successful. More than 600,000 village people through the data driving uh, uh, methodology and get the benefit. And also customers, and they got a good product through the open data and the open knowledge. And FAO just work with us and to transfer, we transfer the GIES technology to FAO OCOP program. OCOP means one country, one priority product program. So uh, several countries already use this, uh, free use this technology in, the, in their national strategy for agriculture development. So such as Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, and Papua New, New, New Guinea, and, and several countries in Asia and the Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say this is the time, this is the era of the data driving. There are challenges, but opportunities. We have no choice except to make a right or a suitable framework in the IGF framework, in the global scale, but also in the local, national, and regional scale. We work locally, we networking globally. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And I think we've really had some really good positions and breakdowns of where you're from, what we're working with from a mechanism perspective, and whether they are actually working or not. And I think we, we ended quite nicely with looking at, you know, creating single market-based 
um, data governance and, and trust mechanisms. And I think that will, that will open me up to you, Alison. We're looking at the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement and um, looking at really that um, single market. What does that mean and what does that look like from a data pers perspective to ensure that this is an effective piece of legislation, but also an, for economic development in Africa, knowing that data is really a crucial perspective for that to be, to be possible. Could you give us your inputs from that perspective? Thank you so much. Um, I think this is a very important aspect of the, data, uh, the African Union data um, policy framework. Um, I think if we look at other data governance and data protection frameworks, they, uh, particularly data protection frameworks, they're very much focused on individualized notions of um, first generation rights, particularly privacy rights. And they're very often in our context not balanced, although some of our data protection regulators are also responsible for freedom, uh, access to information, um, but not often freedom of expression. Um, so I think this balancing of rights, firstly, is not very, you know, um, practiced amongst uh, data protection regulators on the continent. So we have those, firstly, these individualized notions that we've taken from GDPR and are very much based on a very legal, contractual, informed consent. So I think one of the things is actually to acknowledge the need, um, particularly because of these um, drivers around economic development on the continent and these opportunities offered by the African continental free trade area and the digital, a single digital market, is looking at um, or acknowledging or building into our policy because I think it is actually critical to trust that people's um, economic and you know second and third generation rights are also recognised um, in this in this process. And so um, I think if you look at the if you look at the framework, the the issues around you know um, ensuring uh, d data access, ensuring um, that on the continent we shift from a very, very narrow notions of, of national sovereignty and localization, and I'm not suggesting just fr open free flows because I think at the moment we've got about 90% asymmetry in our traffic flows outside the continent, but leveraging that within the continent to ensure that we get these data flows. And for that, we need this trusted um, harmonized framework. So the work of the African Union at the moment is in the second phase, it's in the implementation phase, there's a, um, an action plan for governments, there's a training and capacity building uh, tool that governments can use and that's happening with the RECs and the training of the RECs um, and, and building the institutions, so supporting the network of, of data protection regulators as they take on these um, additional tasks on, on the continent. But I think the, the, the critical issue here is um, you know, the, the lot of the focus from current data governance, as I said, assumes that there are lots of other things in place and is so you know, really focused on, and what we argue in Africa, is a very uneven impact on harms associated with you know, data-driven um, technologies, but not adequate attention to how we redress the uneven um, uh, distribution of opportunities and we want, what we're trying to do is ensure that um, countries are more evenly um, digitally developed um, and have these enabling trust environments to, in order to reap the benefits of a, of a common market, which otherwise is going to be very uneven. Thank you for that. And, and I think you, you, you really touch on some crucial points about the data flow, ensuring that we don't have uneven markets. But I think the, the, the base and the platform of all of this flow really depends on DNS so, and, 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 and aspects around internet protocols. Um, so I'll open the floor up to you to just maybe explain to our audience and maybe your viewpoints on the relationship between trust, data processing, data governance, and domain name systems. Thank you, moderator, uh, and uh, this is very important. In fact, uh, taking uh, from what the doctor mentioned now, so anything in the real world should be implemented on the internet too. So going back to the DNS, as you know, uh, as many of us know that DNS, when it started, the domain name system, they used, for example, for the intellectual property part, uh, say, uh, cyber squatting, when someone maybe registered a trademark. Now, in, there are more, uh, definitions of what is DNS abuse, as an example. Uh, there is the European definition. There is uh, even recently in Jordan, they issued a new data privacy law. So this privacy should be again on the DNS. So, so what we think is suitable maybe is to have a balanced laws and treaties uh, to ensure preservation of the privacy and at the same time include a clear mechanism on how to enable the right holders to reach some needed private data. Uh, in other words, just to say it for as everybody says, 
case. Privacy is very important for everyone. We need to preserve it on the DNS at the same time. For example, everybody knows who follows ICANN processes that since more than 20 years, they are still discussing the who is, what should be there, what shouldn't be there. Of course, private information, uh, address, and so on should be there for sure. Everybody agrees on that. But maybe we need a process how to reach an infringer if the domain name, let's say, was used in bad faith. Uh, and um, maybe um, just uh, s since I work now with the International Trademark Association to mention the latest definition of DNS abuse for the benefit of something which was approved recently, by the way, for, from the Interboard. And it, it's, it's more broad, not only as, we, uh, as when I started said it was only cyber squat or something. No, it, they defined it as any activity that makes or intend to make use of domain name, domain name system, protocol, or any digital identifier that are similar in form or function to domain name to carry out deceptive, malicious, or illegal activity. So uh, I think this, this as, as we started, that shows that we need to implement what we have in the real world, what's coming on the digital, of course. Thank you. Those are very... Um practical points, uh, and I think straight to the point, and I appreciate that. Thank you for that. Um, I've got a really uh, good panel, super lucky. Um, I want to go to uh, to Chang and just speak about, you know, quality control and the research aspect of, of this. I mean, both speakers have, have discussed about how important um, the space is becoming. Um, we've, we've discussed the economic side of things, we've discussed the DNS side of things, and how you know, there's that uh, overlap really between personal data and just data in general, that, you know, and I think we'll get to the point where we won't be able to have a, a really clear distinction because there will really be things that, that work hand in hand um, for, for, for the future of work, the future of how we interact, how we live, um, and the future is actually, we're living in it right now. So from a research and control perspective, what are your viewpoints on, on this particular matter subject? Uh, yeah, this is a good question. Uh, so, uh, uh, quality, data quality control with through three uh, three uh, steps. One is we uh, set up the uh, framework of principles, guidelines, uh, and the standards, the procedures, and the definitely go to the peer review. So we have a stand, uh, three steps for the peer review. First view and second and third view. So definitely, if, uh, if they're conflicted, we need another one. So this is one thing, so go to the uh, framework of uh, uh, structure, uh, procedures, and, and second one, we need a, a professional team uh, for the reviewer, and that's for the data management also. So we have a training program, and the new challenging comes, new data comes, how to deal with this. We have regular meetings, training program, and not only for the uh, reviewer, but for the users, we did this. And third one is for the, uh, the public, after the publishing for the users. We got the feedback to see what, what the quality they want, whether right, this is good or not. So I think this is the key. If the data quality controlled, and the data users will be very, very happy that. When the more and more people to benefit from the data. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I really couldn't agree more. But I'm going to go to you, Raoul. So we've been having these conversations, but the you know the the, the big bad wolf. <laughs> for some, hasn't come up. If we look at economic factors, looking at big tech, um, looking from a Latin perspective, but I think we can also speak from a developing world perspective and Global South, um, when it comes to considerations from an economic perspective, balancing out um, the issues of trust and, and, and a way that we move forward in a manner that is sustainable, um, according to you know development of human rights and respect of privacy, what are your viewpoints on that particular matter? And I'm um, very keen to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Um, um, I think that's, that's, it's clear that the, the, the data ne needs to flow because uh, we need the data to, 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 uh, to be available to uh, make accessible uh, uh, services uh, to uh, favor uh, commercial transactions. Um, 
And so the, the, the objective of all the legal frameworks is that, is that uh, we allow the, 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 the flow, the free flow of information in a secure way. And so the, the certainty, is a legal certainty is good for everybody, for all the, the, the stakeholders. And the, the, I think that we are understanding in, uh, together, different stakeholders, we are understanding that. Um, but uh, in Latin America doesn't have a, a transnational, a transnational, transnational uh, structures like Europe, for example, so we have to deal with, uh, in Latin America and the, and the Caribbean, with more than 30 uh, different jurisdictions. So the, uh, in order to, to make the, we have to make the, 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 the data flow in a way that, that favor the economic development of the whole region, we have to be very careful with the, with, with the laws, and, the, and we spend a, a significant time on discussing with policymakers, and I think that the national uh, and the regional uh, IGFs are, are, are crucial for that, for having an open conversation with, among all stakeholders. Sometimes um, policymakers uh, think that they are doing something uh, that is, uh, goes in the line of uh, protecting rights of the people, and sometimes it could have exactly the opposite, uh, the opposite effect. And this is why it is important that all stakeholders are involved since the inception of the, of the, of the, of the policies. And um, um, okay, I think that's I will stop for the sake of the time. I will stop. Thank you, thank you, thank you for those considerations. Um, so that 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 takes me. I mean, we, that takes me to Lucian. Um, Looking specifically at the legal considerations around this, I know you made mention of WSIS, um, who, if you think about it, you know they've got the common vision and desire and commitment to build a people-centric, inclusive um, development for information society, and looking to ensure that these aspects of data governance and trust are adhered to. If we speak about um, legal considerations and the actual ramifications of antitrust behavior or behavior that really undermines the aspect of trust, uh, what would you give us, I think from your NRI, but also from a global perspective, especially being from the EU and being an, a GDPR expert? Merci. Thank you very much for this exemplary question. We need to seek and to strike a balance. This is of paramount importance between legal security, as was already mentioned previously, and transparency. These are the very bedrock of achieving security and transparency. And at the end of the day, it allows the user to understand what we're going to be doing with the data and also to understand what is the legal framework or the legal frameworks which is applicable to them. At the EU level, as you know, we talk about the decade to 2030, and we see this at the core of many of the agendas. The European Commission, we adopted indicators to follow this digital transformation in the EU and to provide various guidelines to the member states. When we talk about data and the free circulation of data, what is also mentioned, what this also means, it means a digital overhaul, transformation. And in terms of data governance, and I'm going back to your question, this transparency is essential with data that flows and we need to keep an open and neutral internet within this it needs to be interoperable trustworthy that is at the very core of our vision digital is a resource and as well as a challenge and this 18th IGF here in Kyoto bears witness with all of the wealth of the discussions that we need to have a multi-stakeholder approach, which would enable to have a diversity of opinions in this regard. The cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, as well as ideas are all the more various ways to look at these various uh, governance modalities and these various governments. Finally, when we talk about data, this also means that we need to talk 
talk about uh, the similarities between the data and also this open source uh, that is also an, an essential. And we look up all the very specific characteristics. There are gargantuan resources for the internet. We also need to identify what those solutions are for this world governance. In summary, we need to endow ourselves with the clear uh, data, specifically with GDPR. This means to I endow ourselves with clear transparency in terms of these uh, digital resources. We need to have a liability framework with the different stakeholders within the entire value chain, the digital value chain. I think that they're at the very core to be able to develop a trustworthy internet. In summary, internet is not very different. As I stated about the previous philosopher, it is also the bad and it is also the way that we can move forward and the solution to that problem. Thank Thank you very much. You have highlighted transparency, accountability, and ensuring that we have a very people-centric approach, which um, I really do believe is the future and um, is what we're progressively um, aiming to realize at a global scale. So this session is going to um, really open up the floor now, and we'd like to keep this uh, you know, robust. Um, have as much interaction as possible. So this is going to be the beginning of our first round of Q&A. I'd actually like to start with our online questions. If I could see a show of hands um, on the floor for any questions, I do note one. Um, any more hands? We oh, I do, I do note you. <laughs> oh, I do note two, three. Okay, so we'll start with our online questions, and then we will start with, then we'll, we'll proceed to the floor. Thank you so much. Judith, please take the floor. Thanks so much. Um, we have a question from, our, from Chris. He says, he, he directs a question to the, um, to the woman from China when she was talking about data quality, which has to do with data in, in, integrity. And he would like to know what will be some of the recommendations when it comes to data integrity and governance, because we sometimes forget the great importance of data integrity when having some of these conversations. So I'll direct that question to Ms. Chang. Wow, yeah, that's uh, so, so happy to, to everybody, many people, the interest in the data quality. So I think that's uh, uh, from our experience, and uh, we need to work uh, many partners together. Only uh, uh, the scientific uh, uh, academy is, uh, is not uh, uh, good enough, but we work with the governors, uh, with the uh, central government, with the international organizations such as the uh, World Data System, uh, the uh, International Science Council, and we also work with the CoData, uh, International Committee on Data for Science and Technology, and so on. So then we work together then to make the framework, uh, the, uh, the framework that including uh, the principles. So we have uh, had a uh, workshop in, the, in Nairobi to make the uh, data sharing principles. And then we made the, the guidelines uh, we learn from developing country uh, 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 OECD guideline, data guideline, and also we made our uh, developing countries. So I have been uh, to the chair uh, person of the co-data in developing countries for 20 years. So we, we collected the challenges and then what, what could be a suitable operational uh, procedure for, uh, so for the data control. So then we have the uh, standards. Uh, we we uh, set up a, a serious uh, uh, regulation rules about the, how to uh, check, uh, evaluate the table data, uh, special data, image data, and, and so on. So the whole these kind of things we discussed with uh, uh, many uh, organizations. And then let, let this uh, work in China and also suitable in the whole world, especially for the uh, developing countries. For example, we work uh, in, in South Africa, uh, so with the uh, 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 University of Captain, 
and also in the, uh, in, in the Asia country, uh, Mexico University, ECDs. So, and, the, and I think this is acceptable. So in this way, we make the data control and publish the data. And all this kind of data is, uh, we publish 1,020 hundred data sites. No anyone can play for this kind of data. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. If we could please have the first question on the floor, if you could introduce your name, where you're from, and your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Elke Pals. I come uh, from the Netherlands. Um, was also representing the Netherlands NRI uh, years ago. Uh, currently working at KPMG, the Netherlands, in the responsible AI practice. Um, and I would like to share a little bit on uh, also the data governance view that um, from our perspective, because this morning um, there was a session about um, the origin of the internet and also the parallel that we can make with data governance. Um, while the internet started to grow from based on internet exchange points, uh, we can also do that on the same matter with data. So uh, this morning was a session about the Amsterdam data exchange. And that was a session where uh, there was shown that uh, the same setup as the internet can be recreated for the data setup in collaboration with internet exchange points. So in the Netherlands, the Amsterdam internet exchange is a major party in that. But I really encourage all uh, countries also to collaborate with their uh, internet exchange point to come up with the same kind of infrastructure to make the, uh, to connect all the data silos that we currently have. Um, so my question would be, if there are anyone interested in learning a bit more about this, um, yeah, please reach out to me and then we're happy to discuss any uh, further thoughts about that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. And uh, I'm quite certain that the panel will reach out to you. Um, and I think anybody else in the room, we certainly come to these forums and these platforms for exchange of knowledge and to see how we can collaborate and grow the ecosystem. So most certainly, thank you for that. If we can please go to, um, I'm actually going to go uh, row by row. So you can start and the gentleman behind me and then we'll go to the next row. Thank you, please. Uh, if you can introduce yourself, where you're from and your question. Giacomo Mazzone from the Italian IGF. My question is, listening to what has been said, um, what has been said by uh, Lucien about the European example that has uh, consolidated a framework that, uh, on data that looks interesting, is this a model that could be replicated? Uh, do you expect that the Summit of the Future next year uh, data transfer uh, can be one of the topics uh, on which there will, could be proposals. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you could please introduce yourself, where you're from, and your question. And if possible, um, the specific member of the panel you'd like to direct your question to. You can go. So we're going to go from the right to the left, so I, I continue. which is your right, correct? Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Naza uh, Nicholas Kirama. I come from the Tanzania IGF, and I also sit as the president of uh, Internet Society Tanzania chapter. Uh, my question really is about uh, the data governance policy. Um, you have a situation where the, you have you know, huge data centers who are actually concentrated and you know, managed and uh, owned by a few companies, handful companies, you know, the Googles, the Meta, or other uh, you know, um, uh, big tech companies. Uh, and, and now you have uh, a, an issue of uh, data sovereignty if, if there is uh, an issue of uh, you know, uh, data concentrating on a few companies, how do we convince like, uh, countries not to go uh, the data sovereignty way in terms of their policies, 
because they see uh, companies, a handful of companies, you know, have all this data, but uh, the, 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 we are trying to do, the, uh, do them um, uh, not to go the data sovereignty way. So how do we uh, reconcile all, I mean, these two, uh, uh, you know, different uh, uh, polarization situations? Thank you. Thank you so much. Name, where you're from, question, and who you're directing it to. Hi, uh, Andrew Campling. I run a, uh, a public policy and uh, PR consultancy. Um, my question, because it's been a really interesting discussion, uh, but uh, there are changes to internet standards which can result in the loss of data, uh, especially uh, metadata that's used to uh, measure traffic trends, identify malicious activity, um, enable connectivity between different uh, messaging platforms, uh, and for general search, uh, even, dare I say, it, compliance with legislation uh, and, and regulation. Um, now, the bodies involved in data governance and trust are largely absent uh, from the standards bodies, which unsurprisingly are dominated by the uh, technical community. Um, so I, I, I wonder whether, to aid transparency and accountability, uh, do you agree that we need to enable engagement by those uh, bodies um, in the standards organizations like the ITF so that their needs are taken into account when new internet standards are developed. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to take one last question for this round, and then please do, do, do give us the opportunity to just have um, a, a round of answers, and we'll certainly give the next set of questions um, a, a time to, to take the floor. Please, sir, uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank, thanks for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Xiao Yang. I'm from China. Uh, our institution, uh, my organization is Fuxi Institution. It's a non-profit uh, uh, research center uh, funded by Dr. Xiao Dongli, the uh, former vice VP of ICANN. And uh, our organization do both uh, policy and uh, technical research. And uh, data governance is one of our main research fields. Uh, and uh, we are all very active participants in the IGF uh, process, both in the China IGF community and the UN uh, IGF community. And I got two questions. The first is for um, Alison. Alison, uh, maybe I pronounced it right. Uh, during the past few days, I've heard a lot about uh, people are talking about uh, um, the time changing. I think it's also the same with the uh, data governance, the scope and the concept of data governance is changing too. Uh, just as you mentioned, it's not about data only about data protection, it's about access, uh, data quality, and many others. And we've, uh, we, we've observed that more than uh, 100 con uh, economies have published their data, um, data rules, and our analysis showed that the some, uh, some articles are similar, such as uh, the principle is uh, given the individual rights to their personal data. Uh, well, there are also some critical rules are different, such as the definition on uh, personal data, just as Lucian just mentioned, uh, the definition on the data, uh, and the rules for cross-border data flow. And uh, more and more people are realizing the importance of international frameworks or norms on data governance, and uh, we might need some consensus on data governance. And my question is, uh, from your perspective of, of view, at present, uh, is it possible for our to uh, make an international norm or framework on data governance? And if yes, at present, what could be included uh, to, to this consensus? And the data governance is part of the GDC. And what are your, are you expecting the final text of the GDC on data governance? And this is my first question. Uh, my second question is to, um, to Paul and, uh, 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 and Ms. Liu Chuang. And uh, um, uh, now we have a lot of international pla platforms and organizations, such as the IGF, OECD, APEC, uh, the World Internet Conference, they're all talking about data and the data governance. 
And do you think it's necessary, or is there any uh, mechanism to regularly collect their outputs? And afterward, just as many uh, uh, participants of this, uh, this meeting have uh, said, uh, we can't discuss something always from the beginning. We need to move on from where consensus or outcomes have been reached. Do you think, and, and in addition, do you think uh, the NRI, uh, NRIS should play a role in this mechanism or process? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you for those questions, and uh, I do hope that the panel have noted these down. I saw you all jotting down. So perhaps we'll start with the first question. Um, oh, no, no. So we're going to first have the first round of questions, and then we'll certainly, when, when the second round of questions come up, then we'll, we'll take that. I just want to afford the panel the opportunity to answer adequately, and then we'll open up the um, Q&A again, or the Qs, rather. So we'll go to the A's now. Go ahead, Raul. Okay. Uh, so many many comments and interesting uh, uh, questions, uh, but I I didn't answer uh, something that you asked to me in the in the first, in the previous uh, round when you um, uh, asked about the balancing approaches for development, and um, as, um, I think it's very it's very timely to to comment on that too because. I don't think that's, that there should be a trade-off between uh, development and, and, and rights. And the, what we need is, is just to include the perspective of, of uh, development, the needs for uh, social, economic, and human development in the, as uh, objectives of the, uh, of the legal frameworks. And uh, there is a risk when we copy and paste uh, um, 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 policies uh, from other regions that probably other regions have no exactly the same objectives that, or needs than, than a developing uh, region like Latin America or um, surely I, I, don't, I can't speak about Africa but I think that this is the same situation. Uh, so the, uh, this is my first point. The, um, uh, somebody, there were two questions about uh, the GDC uh, and the um, data, new mechanisms. I don't think that we need the new mechanisms. I don't think that uh, that uh, uh, probably the GDC will include something about uh, about data protection. I think that it should be at the level of principles and not. Uh, there are there are different uh, approaches uh, to data protection. I think all of them are valid, and so probably in uh, in um, in the Western world, the GDPR is the is the um, is very well known, but it's not the only uh, approach to data protection. I think that is 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 useful to have uh, all those uh, legal frameworks. We need obviously uh, coordination and dialogue uh, among different. Um, uh, countries that have different approaches in order to ensure that everybody is, everything is interoperable. Uh, about data sovereignty is a, is a concept that I prefer not to comment on that. I think that we will need much more time for that. And this is a, there is not a single uh, definition or a common understanding of what uh, data sovereignty means. And definitely I'm against uh, data localization. I think that uh, this is, uh, is uh, terrible and it's a very bad idea to, to impose data localization and, and especially for, for uh, smaller companies and developing countries. Uh, we, we could uh, talk more about that, but for the sake of the time, I will just say that this is a bad thing. Um, with regard to the standards, uh, I think, I don't know if it is uh, necessary that, that, uh, that data protection, uh, the people in, involved in data protection authorities participate in, in, in standard bodies. I think that it is really very important that they understand the architecture of the internet, how it works. Uh, but not only them, every policymaker is, uh, with responsibilities on digital issues should understand how internet works. This is the basic thing and of course it includes also the people involved in data protection and trust. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to open the floor for Alison to answer. I do have opposing views on the GDC's approach. Um, and perhaps, I don't know, uh, if, if Alison, as you answer that, 
Uh, maybe just do you walk us through, you know, the GDC and data governance and trust as, a, as one of the key pillars um, in really achieving our common agenda and, you know, the, the core principles that, that if we think about data protection and privacy come from. Uh, I'll open the floor up to you to do that. And then after that, I'd like us to speak about the second question that Raul um, alluded to, uh, which, which speaks to, uh, you know, data loss and, and, and looking at, at that scope of things. So, Alison, if you, if you could please. Thanks very much. I'll, I'll just address um, Nazar Rama's question that I think was relating specifically to, to Africa. And um, the person, I'm afraid I didn't catch their name, from the Fuji Institute who addressed questions specifically but landed up with a GDP, GDC. So hopefully we'll get there and I'll try and be very quick. Um, so thank you very much for the important question around um, you know, data warehouses and the absence of them and the issues that that raises for um, data so sovereignty and that you know, most of our data is going outside of the continent and being stored out of the continent, um, often under um, not enforced governance arrangements that ensure reciprocity or you know, uh, common legal frameworks. In the context of the African Union, because after that I'm going to speak about our own research as opposed to the African Union research, um, there is an acknowledgement that, as I, I mentioned, that we need these basic foundational infrastructures. We need the basic um, broadband infrastructure, we need the digital infrastructure, we need the data infrastructure, and then of course we need the digital ID foundation in order to get these trusted environments um, so that people can interact you know, com 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 comprehensively and e equitably in the environment. So the data infrastructure one is, is an absolute critical one and this course is dependent on the um, uneven digital infrastructure that we already have in the continent. What I think what we have tried to move from was a very strong, um, uh, probably unrealistic notion of data sovereignty and localization that each country, um, you know, whether it, it, its priorities were or could afford it, would be required to keep their own data warehouses, that each would have to build their own data warehouses. There are obviously such enormous benefits in, um, you know, and cost and, and other benefits in cloud services that it makes sense to, um, you know, to do that in, in virtual environments that you're only paying for the cost that you need, et cetera, while ensuring that the data is held safely and under the conditions that pr protect your country's data, data subjects. Within the context of the um, African as the single digital market, what we are asking for is for the development of these data, this kind of data infrastructure across the continent, so that um, you know, where it's already being provided in some parts of the continent, you know, quite significant amounts of, of data warehousing and storage going on in Southern Africa, for example, that this is made available into the, on the continent and that we have um, cost-based access to this data amongst Africans that can use this um, data more effectively and more cost-effectively. So I think it, it is a critical policy issue that we've got to shift our um, position to the, some of the realities around Africa so that we can benefit from those data flows uh, that we are wanting uh, you know, across the continent. And also just acknowledging that you know, sitting on data that you're unable to store, process, um, you know, uh, share, charge for, um, really doesn't build data value, um, you know, public data or, or, or commercial value. Um, just very quickly then to, um, you know, go to the important questions raised by the person from the Fuji Institute. You know, I think, I think this is exactly the kind of governance issues that we are struggling with now. Um, is ar around getting some kind of consensus that we absolutely need for global governance. I think a lot of the times we are talking about national and regional, um, you know, harmonization and, or, you know, establishment of, of policies that are, are now evolving with the changing um, technologies that we have. But in fact, many of the enforcement aspects of this, whether it's around data protection or misinformation or, you know, a number of things, actually requires global governance. It requires us to globally cooperate to, um, you know, deal with big tech that has, you know, bigger, bigger money and interests than many of our countries, um, and to, to collaborate around some sort of normative consensus. Now, of course, the normative consensus that we've kind of imagined we have is, is vulnerable. It's fragmented. Um, I think how, and I think there's been some kind of um, attempts to kind of get us into a, a false consensus, right? sometimes by shifting 
language of human rights to people-centered so that we can accommodate that. Um, on the other hand, I do think that there are historically very um, ignored issues around, um, you know, other aspects of human rights, as I mentioned, in, in terms of economic justice and actually shifting it. So if you've just got you know, um, human rights of privacy, uh, if you've got, as we move into AI, you know, ethics by design and these kinds of things, they only, many, many people in the world do not, have, firstly do not have those rights in the analog world and we're expecting them to have sort of digital rights in this normative consensus that we <laughs> are fabricating. Um, but on the other hand, you know, people are unable to exercise those rights because of their, their economic conditions and their uh, human development conditions, which means we have to address that. And so from Research ICT Africa's position, not the African Union's position, in terms of the Global Digital Compact, which is obviously a very important process that's been underway here with the Digital Envoy um, uh, during this week, is to argue that what we need is not just you know, a data compliance regime around data, which will not redress the kind of um, inequalities, structural inequalities, qualities that the Secretary General is speaking about, but that we need to be looking at data justice. How do we get just outcomes? Because simply, you know, a first generation rights framework and uh, ethics is not going to require the transformation that we need for inclusion, for equitable participation and the redress of digital inequality. Thank you for that. Um, Alison, Charles, if you could take a, a go at, at my question. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, I'd like to answer the, what the gentleman asked about uh, when he mentioned some of the data loss, so the meta tags and so on, which is, this is something, as you know now, per the privacy laws, you, companies cannot use them. But what, we, are, we should always remember that we are going to the AI and everybody talking about artificial intelligence and this, this system depends on the data. So again, uh, as I mentioned when I talked about the IP that we need something balanced. So we need the balanced laws, how to, what is allowed, what is not allowed, making sure keeping the privacy at the same time, the data needed for the systems to operate as it was designed for is needed. Um, maybe the other issue, if you allow me to answer because someone asked about about how when we put our data in another country. So this again depends on the country's law. So some government entities usually, and even private sector, doesn't like their data to be in another country. But I think we can, if we go years back, when the banks, let's say, started, of course, many years back. So you're thinking, should I put my money in the bank or not? So it depends on the bank reputation. Is it... Uh, uh, you can, is it secure, you can depend on that. So I think we can look at the data in the same way. If we know that we want to, uh, our data to be safe, uh, backed up, uh, safe from any even natural disaster, so maybe we want to choose a company that we know that it is good. But again, we have to go back again to the countries in, the, uh, in each country, the laws, sorry, in each country, to make sure that it allows me to put my data somewhere else. Thank you for that. Chang, if I could give you the floor to answer your set of questions. Yeah. That's uh, regarding the, uh, the uh, platform. This is a new tool uh, since the data uh, come. Uh, this is actually the platform is accelerator. Uh, so without the platform, uh, the data does stay there and not network together. So, uh, but the, but the platform divide, can divide a different uh, style or different kinds. Some uh, some platform is project based and the support for the uh, cert, uh, certain target. Different organization, different project, they have have a different uh, platform. This is understandable. And another one is uh, some project is short term, maybe three years. When the pro, uh, project closed, and the platform maybe stay a few years and then closed. So this is a risk uh, for the, in this case, maybe the data got lost. So, uh, so in this case, so International uh, Science Council, so have the pro program that, uh, not program, this international organization is called the World Data System. This is the home of the world data. World data site. This uh, uh, requires that the data, the any uh, members of the world data system, 
should be kept long term preserved and protected and keep this open available to everyone. So this this is another type of the platform. So so I suggest so uh, our this is a, a national and a regional IGF initiatives can help this help to indicate the risk. Some platform if before they close, they need, should help them to transfer migrate to somewhere else in case the data and the platform technology got lost. Or migrate maybe technical data tech, uh, format uh, software updated. So maybe the, the, the new one couldn't access the older system. So need a, need a uh, uh, interjectable of the system. So I think this is empty now. We need to do this. Thank you very much for your question. And this is uh, one big challenge also. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Lucien, if I could give you a go um, to you know, look at the questions that have been asked in this round and, and give a very brief um, input from your end. Merci beaucoup et merci. Thank you very much, and thank you for all of the questions which were asked. I will try to be as brief because I can see that we're coming to the last 15 minutes of the session. So, firstly, with regard to the application at an international level of legal standards. In French law, for example, we say that no one is supposed to be above the law. We could also think about the fact that ignorantia juris non exquisite from Latin, which is an international version of the French. So what do we do? What can we do at an international level in order to understand these laws? Well, first of all, we need to develop frameworks together, which are accessible to all, easily understandable from the citizen to the state. And of course, these frameworks have to be developed within international organizations. A certain number of questions raised the issue of the International Digital Pact and the possibility of integrating into this a number of questions which were asked here specifically with regard to data governance and AI governance. And similarly, what is AI today? Was machine learning yesterday or computational mathematics yesterday? So here, what we're really talking about is that one needs the other. Data is essential for AI and vice versa. And of course, today, AI is based today on this data. So this global pact can be seen as an opportunity to strengthen this international cooperation, which has been uh, mentioned by the distinguished Secretary General Guterres. This could perhaps give uh, a due place to the IGF and to regional initiatives, as some of my colleagues mentioned, and na national initiatives, which would allow a crossing between the discussions taking place here at an international fora and each individual in his or her region or in their country working closely with citizens to be able to really roll things out on the ground and propose adapted solutions. One last word, if I may, the EU, as you know, as part of the digital decade, is looking for a human-centered approach for AI and emerging technologies. A text is currently being redacted, which will address this issue, but also the upcoming entry into force of new cybersecurity frameworks, which are inherently linked with the issue of trust and the individual citizens' trust of the digital environment, raises the issue of the individual citizen and his or her understanding of what's at stake. 
we said at the very opening of the session that perhaps one of the issues where I'd like to um, conclude, if I may, is the issue of awareness raising education, understanding what this data is, understanding what we do with data, and understanding when a digital service or an artificial intelligence uses data, how and why it does so. So that requires transparency and responsibility. Thank you very much, sir. And I think you're absolutely right. Awareness is key, ensuring that there's literacy and understanding, and also getting everybody you know, involved in, in the discourse and discussion, decision-making, but also ensuring that governance. I'm going to open the floor again for our set of questions. If you could please keep it brief, do mention your name, where you're from, and who you're directing the question to. Uh, we also have an online question. So we'll ask the online question first. Um, this question is from Mahamat Habib from the Republic of Chad, and thanks to Lucian for the English translation. He asks, I am wondering about data collection by government and the use of such data by companies with which states are contracting. And he's particularly concerned about the cybersecurity ramifications of this. So if uh, one of the panelists can answer that, he would be grateful. Thanks so much. So before we do the answering, if we could also take questions from the floor and then we'll proceed. Please go ahead. I'm Mahi from uh, IGF Sri Lanka. And uh, our uh, statement is like this. Uh, the global issues need, to be, need solutions of global level. And in 2019, uh, Windsurf uh, warned about the data governance frameworks could become tools for censorship and surveillance in a BBC interview. And uh, today, it is uh, coming a reality. Uh, they are that GDPR, UK online safety bill, and uh, the Sri Lankan uh, proposed safer internet bill is uh, carrying such uh, issue to the, uh, what we call a good data governance process. So <clears throat> uh, there are a lot of things that we need to do. Meanwhile, the participation and engagement of the stakeholders is the main thing uh, and open and transparent mode. But uh, meanwhile, in, we need to support the civil society organizations that are working to create this uh, good data governance uh, in the field. So it's my proposal that we need to work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tanara Lauschner. I am the coordinator of the Brazilian IGF. I have a quite brief comment here. I would like to echo the words of, the, of my colleagues who spoke about, about the importance of trust on data governance process and emphasize that for this to happen, it is essential that data is used for good where everyone has the opportunity to benefit from its power, not leaving strong protections aside. Considering these in the context of emerging technologies, responsible data governance is even more important. This has been vastly discussed in this IGF and other internet governance fora, such as our Brazilian IGF. Some strategies to ensure this responsibility include reinforce data protection laws and regulations, as Brazil and other countries are doing with their own national laws. In our case, as Raul already mentioned, the Brazilian General Data Protection Law, LGPD, in the acronym in Portuguese. Uh, the other strategy is to promote education and awareness, awareness among the population and development of responsible and human-centric technologies by design. Let us commit to working together using the multi-stakeholder approach to develop international data governance standards that are balanced and protect individual rights. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for that. And we've got our last question from the floor. Please announce where you're from and uh, or your name and who you're directing the question to. Bonjour. Uh...
Good day. My name is Sebastian Bacharé. I'm a member of Isaac France and a coordinator of the IGF in France. And I think that it's important to use the language service that is proposed here. So as Lucien responded in French, I will also speak French. It's wonderful that we can use the different languages of the United Nations and Otherwise, diversity of languages will be lost. Now, I'd like to mention something that was mentioned at other meetings, the dynamic coalition of values that are at the heart of the Internet, which, of course, must be deliberated in the different uh, IGF regional and national meetings. Here's my question. How do you see the uh, evolution of the link between the anonymous data and the responsibility to protect people's personal data, and the need to know who is contacting you or to not say who is attacking you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. If we could have the panel answer the questions. I think we'll start with you, Charles, and then we'll flow all the way down to Lucien. Thank, oh, sorry. thank you. In fact, I, uh, I thank Sebastian for a very important point he mentioned. Uh, maybe uh, maybe to answer the question, I could start with the word uh, from George Bernardo. I think that uh, when he said uh, um, this information is even more, uh, it's not the same words, of course, used, but I mean the meaning that it is it is more dangerous than ignorance. So maybe this is what uh, Sebastian meant, uh, meant when he said that we need to be sure how to have really a good balance. Again, I'm using the word balance a lot, I know. But because we don't want any information which is, it which is really a misinformation to, to, to be the one that people follow. So I think the best way to tackle this is mainly awareness as we started, and even the theme of our uh, meeting this year in general was mainly to empower users. So we need to, to, to more learning, more awareness for users to make sure how to get the, the, the knowledge needed to know that this is at least uh, correct or this is just someone just saying anything or so on. So this is, I think, important. At the same time, of course, maybe we, we, uh, we tackled this in the previous question, uh, the most important for the what information about me should be on the internet should be with my consent, I think. So this is, I think, the better thing. Thank you. If I could just remind panelists, just to keep it brief, we don't have a lot of time left. Thank you. Thanks very much. I really just wanted to respond um, to the reference to um, countries working on these safety bills. Um, it was mentioned Sri Lanka and um, other countries that are working on it. And I suppose it was a point that I was wanting to make earlier about um, and, and didn't around the issues around um, rule of law and legitimacy, um, but also the processes by which these mechanisms are put in place. And I think, you know, because I've been particularly asked to look at the Sri Lankan safety, uh, digital um, uh, services safety bill that's being proposed, um, but it's also come up in the context of the um, civil society uh, petitions for better um, consultation around the um, UK AI safety laws that are being proposed and also the laws that are being proposed in, in, in US, that we need to really guard against um, essentially, you know, repressive or surveillance type or um, controls on freedom of expression that are occurring in the name of, of, of safety legislation. And that's, you know, when often we're taking um, legislation or um, good practice, what we see as good practice, from environments where there are human rights frameworks or their constitutional protections, and then we're putting them into contexts where there's you know, these rights don't exist. Um, we need to really ensure that you know, the data protection laws have very clear, um, or the cybersecurity laws have very clear safeguards on um, you know, illegitimate state surveillance and these kinds of things. And so I think focusing on the safety <laughs> really is important and in bringing people into the process in terms of accountability of the process, but also expertise needed from you know, outside of government to ensure that these systems um, are, in the, are operating in the public interest. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Raul, if I could ask you to give it a go and keep it brief, please. Yes, uh, there was a question about the, the um, or a comment about the co concern of the how the, the uh, governments uh, uh, manage the, the information and um, probably uh, passing information to uh, private companies. So I think that's uh, very easy. I don't know to answer from my side. Is, uh, 
governments have uh, same and even more responsibility than, than others in respecting the laws. So the, 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 there is no uh, uh, exceptions uh, for them, um, except I, I, I know, I'm aware that, uh, that some countries uh, oh, can put some um, uh, justifications on it to, to do a different management of the, of the data, but in, a, I think, in democratic countries and um, free countries, uh, the, the governments uh, have exactly the same responsibility than others and should have the same responsibility or even more that and so they and that's I, I guess is the situation in, in Latin America so the, the if uh, if there is a transfer of information from the government to, to a private company should be exactly according the the, the terms that are established in the in the in the legal framework of the, the country Thank you so much. Chang, if you could give uh, 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 your opinions and at least answers to the questions that were posed. Yeah, <clears throat> the government is the big data holder. The government and the government funded uh, project data uh, is the big data holder. So that's, uh, and the very valuable. Uh, uh, so make the government data uh, transfer to private sector or uh, the research universities to broad use, that is uh, good. So in China, we had also had this uh, such kind of policy, uh, give uh, what kind of government data to what kind of um, private sectors to use them and for the, uh, the, the people to use them. Uh, then there are some uh, regulations and uh, some have a uh, uh, license uh, to get the data, to use the data. And uh, I think this is good. Um, with the data, more data available, so more and more data public available, that should be the benefit of socioeconomic development. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice and short. I appreciate that. Listen, can you <laughs> follow suit? Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. So I will be brief as well. With regard to data protection, I think then we can, in France, go back to the 60, rather 78 law and the creation of a commission and the reflection on the protection of uh, private life data and access to that data. In the broader issue of governance of data, well, it has to do with research's ability to access data and then to understand what was done. Because access to data also allows abuse. So, for example, we see in the subject of disinformation, and it's been regularly discussed in the issue of access of citizens to data, so, but let me conclude on perhaps something on a more positive note, more transparency and cooperation will only help us to be more efficient in the governance that we are trying to achieve, multi-stakeholder governance. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Lucien. Read out, there was a panelist that was meant to join us, but he did um, give out uh, his, uh, his uh, inputs to this discussion. I will keep it quite brief. We are running extremely out of time. So the, the, the inputs was, it. With it as follows, it's hard to think out of the box sometimes and move the discussion forward, and it's not easy to find practical and innovative solutions to complex challenges we are facing in the arena of trustworthiness of the internet of uh, on a global level. He also added that there's a widening gap between the complexities surrounding data security, data protection, and privacy, and the capacity for fostering a robust and trusted internet at uh, a global um, scale or uh, global global ecosystem level. He further said that multilateral approaches and govern, government interventions have failed over the past years to achieve concrete results in this direction. The United Nations system also explored these interventions severally, but with minimal results. And I think so. these are really you know, honest, um, hitting the, the nail on the head um, inputs. So our speaker is um, uh, uh, our colleague from Nigeria, uh, Sagun Ologbile, I hope I'm saying that correctly. And um, these are really cru crucial inputs. I really do appreciate that. I, I, I'm going to ask Judith to summarize on behalf of the speakers. I would love, I would have loved to give you an opportunity. But Judith, if you could just give us an overview of the session, um, if we can keep it under one minute, we are slightly over time. Hi, thanks so much. 
So you wanted the overview of, so there was a lot of comments here about, on the online about data governance, data protection, um, how to store data safely, and comments from, from other ones of like, making sure the data is not stored in house because what happens when there's a fire in the building, then you lose all the data. So there's really, that is one of the reasons why um, when Allison was talking about storing the data in the cloud and storing the data in different, either in different locations or in different parts because we want to make sure that uh, the data is secure. And if you have it all one place, then you could have accidents. That's why one of the key best practices is storing the data in different locations. And in the cloud, there is often stored even in different cloud sections because one cloud could be down or could have a corruption in it. So that's, I think th this touched about a lot of the issues of data sovereignty. Data sovereignty is really also taking advantage of in your particular law. Just because your data happened to be stored in another country, it's not under that country's law. It's under your law, and it's under what is in your data protection agreement. And that, that's why it's important to have a good data protection policy and legislation. But uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but I think that summarizes some of the comments and the questions we were having on them. But thanks. Thank you so much, and thank you for this very interactive session. I know that um, we've really tried our best to ensure that uh, the opinions, the questions from the floor have been articulated. At the end of the day, we really do promote multi-stakeholderism and ensuring that everybody's voice from a global perspective is certainly represented, and I think we were represented well today, um, with your expert opinions and the body of work that, bodies of work that you have done um, you know, outside of the stage that have been articulated. Uh, we really do thank you on behalf of the IGF community and myself, Zanyu and Tati Sare, if you could please give um, my panel a round of applause for the excellent work that they've done. Uh, I, I open the floor for you to do so and we will close the floor on that, on that accord. Thank you so much.